funding for a walk around Brooklyn with David Hartman has been provided by the Empire Insurance Group. Empire Insurance Group has proudly served the insurance needs of Brooklyn's neighborhoods and New York State for 75 years through local independent agents. Empire is proud to be part of the renaissance of Brooklyn. This program is also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Additional funding was provided by Greenpoint Bank, the Jerome S. Belson Foundation, the New York State Education Department, the Friends of 13, J. Dozier Hasty, the Rita J. and Stanley H. Kaplan Family Foundation, and by the Honorable Howard Golden, Brooklyn Borough President. From the heart of New York City, you're looking east past the East River to Brooklyn, New York, or as some Brooklynites like to say, Brooklyn, USA. Along with Staten Island, Queens, the Bronx, and Manhattan, Brooklyn is one of the five counties or boroughs that make up New York City. Hi, I'm David Hartman. I'm standing on the Brooklyn Bridge about halfway between Manhattan and Brooklyn. In our other video walking tours, we've done 42nd Street, Broadway, and Harlem. Now we're leaving Manhattan for the first time to experience giant Brooklyn. It's giant size, more than 11 by nine miles. People, over 2.3 million. It's been called a great city masquerading as a borough of New York City. Brooklyn is 400 years of energy, vivacious neighborhoods of many languages, faiths, and cultures. It's music and art, churches and Coney Island, parks and gardens, beaches and boats. George Washington and his troops escaped from the British here. The Dodgers deserted Brooklyn for LA. It's been called the promised land for immigrants, a place that speaks with an accent. Brooklyn is alive. Our tour guide is the irrepressible Barry Lewis, architecture historian, trained at Berkeley in the Sorbonne. He teaches at the New York School of Interior Design and the Cooper Union Forum. Let's go to Brooklyn. Barry and I are about 30 stories up on an observation deck that goes around most of this building. What is the building? Well, I think you could call it the Empire State Building in Brooklyn. It was built as the Williamsburg Savings Bank in 1929, and today at HSBC, people see the clock towers and for miles around have no idea what they're looking at. It's about time they knew. It's the Williamsburg Savings Bank on the ground floor of this building, beautiful banking hall, wonderful mosaic map of the original six towns of Brooklyn. And, uh, now, here's where we are. That yellow dot shows you where we are. We're on the eastern edge of downtown. You started the program here at the Brooklyn Bridge. We're going to be soon at the Fulton Ferry Landing, just below the bridge. Brooklyn Heights is below that. If you follow the waterfront around past the Manhattan Bridge, we're going to be at Dumbo, Dumbo. soon. Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. I mean, David. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay. I'll get with it. And uh, beyond Dumbo, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, we're going to be covering that waterfront. In this area, you have a beautiful view of Fulton Street. This is the road, the street that made Brooklyn what it is today. It's the old King's Highway, and it came in from Long Island, and we are on Long Island. How, how many New Yorkers know that? Even? Few, very few. I mean, the, the Long Island Historical Society had to change their name to the Brooklyn Historical Society because they, they were so tired of answering that question. You see, just to prove to you, this is, this shows you that Brooklyn, in fact, is on Long Island. And it, that is why Brooklyn became the great city it is, because it served as the doorway from Long Island to New York. Long Island was the breadbasket for New York. And all that produce came down the King's Highway, which in Brooklyn is called Fulton Street, right to the ferry across the East River to those hungry, hungry New Yorkers. <laughs> right. And that's why Brooklyn, of course, grew and won out and gobbled up all the other towns of Kings County. Now, there were a bunch of towns here? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to get to that in a second. OK. But to show you something that's geological that had so much effect on the development. Geologist of Barry Lewis. That I am. I mean, you know, a mountain, it's high. That's what I know. But here we are. This is the terminal moraine. 
Now, the terminal moraine is a line of hills. Spell moraine. M-O-R-A-I-N-E. Okay. Terminal because it's where the ice cap, from hundreds of thousands of years ago, it's where the ice cap terminated, okay. left a line of hills, which is very important because before the modern era, where there were hills, that's where the rich people settled. So, if you look at the terminal moraine, you know where the wealthy people were, from Bay Ridge mm -hmm. through to Sunset Park. By the way, there is where Prospect Park is today, and at that point, the terminal moraine turns eastward and goes right through Long Island, creates the Gold Coast of North Shore Long Island. That Gold Coast really begins with Crown Heights right over here. Now, when the Dutch settled this place, they divided it into six townships. You notice Brooklyn is only one of them. The reason why Brooklyn grew and annexed and gobbled up all the other townships is because it was the township closest to New York City. So eventually, the townships of Bushwick and Flatbush and New Utrecht and Flatlands and Gravesend were all absorbed into Brooklyn. Then when did Brooklyn become part of New York City? Well, after the big fish of Brooklyn ate up the little fish of Kings County, then the even bigger fish of New York grabbed Brooklyn in 1898. This is a great map, beautiful map, of the main roads of Brooklyn, the main highway that made Brooklyn, Fulton Road. There it is it, with the dots. Right below it, by the way, is the, the yellow, of course. The yellow dot is where we are in the old Williamsburg Savings Bank Tower. Now, running past it, this is Atlantic Avenue. The Long Island Railroad in the 1830s chose the same corridor as Fulton Street. It's Long Island's only railroad. Everybody's favorite railroad. Oh, we love the Long Island Railroad, like the BQE. That's right. <laughs> and uh, the next most important road, of course, would be Flatbush Avenue in red. Flatbush Avenue originally began at Fulton Street. It was only extended to the East River when the Manhattan Bridge opened up in 1909. But it basically connected Brooklyn with the old town of Flatbush and the marshy lands of Jamaica Bay. The next most important road is probably Bedford Avenue here in yellow, the longest street in Brooklyn. It's about 10 miles long. It goes from Greenpoint in the north down to Sheepshead Bay in the south. Greenpoint? Well, my kindergarten teacher said Greenpoint, so I'm doing a little bit better than doing she would. Right, right. And you know, this road was so important in old Brooklyn that this was the parade route in the 19th century. Every holiday, they had parades going down Bedford Avenue. Another important road, 4th Avenue, connecting downtown Brooklyn uh, to Bay Ridge, running past the neighborhoods of South Brooklyn, uh, Park Slope, Sunset Park, Bay Ridge, right to the bridge, as a matter of fact, right to Verrazano Bridge. Another important old road, I always think of it as the Gravesend Road, Everybody calls it McDonald Avenue today, but it's the old Gravesend Road that ran to Lady Moody's Gravesend Settlement. And we also see on this map the Olmsted and Vaux Greenbelt of the 1870s, one of the great innovations of the old Victorian city of Brooklyn. Prospect Park was the heart of it, and Ocean Parkway across the flatlands to the beaches at Coney Island, Eastern Parkway along the ridge of the Terminal Moraine out east to Long Island. This created a green belt throughout the city of Brooklyn that will be imitated across the country. And we also see here the precursor to Prospect Park, 1840s Greenwood Cemetery, one of the most beautiful romantic cemeteries in the United States. This looks like a quilt. That, well, it is, it, that's Brooklyn. You know, it could just as well be a map of the, of the Holy Roman Empire. And the, these could be separate states, these neighborhoods, because Brooklyn, it, it, people, everybody knows Brooklyn, but they only know a tiny little area. They know their neighborhood, or where they grew up, or where grandma and grandpa lived, or right. the cousins lived. Right. They know their neighborhood, and they, their tiny little neighborhood, and they know the city. You mean Manhattan oh, City? Manhattan, sure. Now, Thomas Wolfe, and I have to read this because I don't want to get this wrong. He said, it would take a guy a lifetime to know Brooklyn true and true, and even then you wouldn't know the whole thing. And he was absolutely right. And here, great map of the 18th century in red, Fulton Road. And at the western end of the Fulton Road, that yellow dot, that's the Fulton Ferry Landing. That's where Brooklyn really began. Now, we're going to go down there just north of the Ferry Landing to what used to be the site of 
painter Francis Guy's home in the 1810s in the old village of Brooklyn. corner of Front and Dock Streets, and this artist, Francis Guy. We're lucky Francis Guy settled here in 1817. He was an Englishman by birth. He had his ups and downs in England, finally had to leave England because of debt problems, comes to America, has even more ups and downs, and finally, for the second time in his life, he settles in Brooklyn, the village of Brooklyn, and he decides he's, he's a painter, and not at all, not at all officially trained, but this was America. We didn't have any kind of academic establishment. So if you call yourself a painter, you're a painter. And he's, he was right here, right in back of us, his little house, and he painted what he saw out his window. And this is what he saw. He painted between 1817 and 1820. And here's one of them showing you what Brooklyn Village looked like in that period when there were only about 7,000 people in this little village. So we're, we're standing right where he, he Just was standing, about looking here. Same, the same direction, right? Right, exactly the way we're looking, okay, which so means is there is Front Street down there. You see it here in the painting. Dock Street is right in front of us. Right. It goes right, right through the front of the painting. Okay. And these houses included, well, this was, uh, this was a hardware shop, which, by the way, was also the post office for the village. Uh, this was pretty common in those days. This is the blacksmith shop with the gabled roof. There is the barn and butcher shop, and there is the carpenter shop. And you know what's interesting? All of these guys lived above their business because this was the pre-modern era. It was no different. The Medici's lived above the bank in Florence, so he lived above his hardware store. And we went right from Brooklyn to Florence hey, like that. This is a world You're city. You're amazing. This is a world city. Now, okay, now we're looking... 50, 60 years later, look at what Brooklyn looks like. You have old Fulton Street, uh, and of course this was mostly demolished in 1950 with, for urban renewal. The anchorage of the Brooklyn Bridge is going up. It's right across the street from us. So this is the, what, the anchorage, the Brooklyn anchorage of the Brooklyn Bridge. Absolutely. This is what holds the cables in place. And to go inside that anchorage, and it's very often open in the summers, often, in fact, they use it for off-off-Broadway shows, concerts, okay. graves. Actually, the anchorage is right here. It's almost like... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's almost like, a, like Judy Garland's house in The Wizard of Oz. It just came right out of the sky, right into the middle of Francis Guy's little village. We're just a few hundred yards around the corner from where Francis Guy actually painted those paintings. Here we are in Old Fulton Street, Fulton Ferry Slip, Manhattan in the background with the Twin Towers and the Woolworth Building and the Brooklyn Bridge, and it is just, it is gorgeous. Well, the man who chronicles Brooklyn when it was growing down here in Lower Fulton Street is Walt Whitman. He's always associated with Brooklyn. He was born on Long Island, but he came here to Brooklyn when he was a kid, stayed here most of his life. According to him, his happiest days was when he was the chief editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This is the headquarters building of which you know. It was founded in 1841, became the most widely read afternoon paper in America, won four Pulitzer Prizes in its career before it closed down in 1955. It was right over here for most of the 19th century until it moved up the hill in the late 19th century along with everybody else when the new Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn emerged up there on the hill. And it was replaced in the 1890s by this beautiful neo-Romanesque warehouse that's now a condominium. There it says, Eagle Warehouse and Storage Company. Now, here is a front page of the Brooklyn Eagle. When he was editor, it's April 1846, you know, it's interesting, the Kings County Democrat, I mean, it was a political... Well, organ, this was right? the mouthpiece for the Democratic Party in Brooklyn, and this is why, by the way, Whitman lost his job in this paper a couple of years after he began. It was over politics. You know, he was completely against slavery, and the Democratic Party in Brooklyn was for slavery. And so he... Now, what was his routine? He would write, write his editorials or whatever he was doing, and then what? He'd work in the, in the, in the headquarters building, and then when he'd finished, He'd go down to the public bathhouse here at the foot of Fulton Street, a 20-minute bath, not a minute longer, and then he'd get on the, on the Brooklyn Ferry, and he would cross Brooklyn Ferry, the East River, to New York City. And he loved going into Manhattan. Oh, I mean, he, he, yeah. he loved the city, and it was part of... I, 
it was part of what made Whitman special. Everybody knows he was a great poet, but he really was an iconoclast, a man who thought for himself. He was a very matter-of-fact gay guy in the days when you were not matter-of-fact about things like that. Then another thing, he loved this country's democratic republicanism. He, he believed in the democracy of this country, and this is important because in the 1840s and 50s, when he is writing, for instance, Leaves of Grass comes out in 1855. Now, this is a second edition. But in this period, Americans are getting richer and richer. They're beginning to try and imitate the aristocrats of oh, Europe. Yes, they're, they're trying to, the rich are trying to distance themselves from the hoi polloi of America. Not Whitman. He loved the common people. He loved the ordinary working people. And that's what he wrote about. And I, I think, really, he captures the spirit of this city, Brooklyn, when it, it had muscle, when it was growing into one of America's greatest cities. And right down the street from the old Brooklyn Eagle newspaper site, the end of old Fulton Street, here we are in the actual ferry slip. How important, Barry, were the ferries? Were bridges, were trains to all of, to Brooklyn, what it became? Transportation made Brooklyn what it is today. I mean, Brooklyn's here on Long Island. Long Island is the breadbasket for New York. The food is all coming down the ferry road, Fulton Street. Remember, this was this ferry started in the 1640s. Wow. It's a hundred wow. years later. You notice how great the development was. <laughs> but that's because it was it was a sailboat, the ferry. And you, it just tacked its way across the river. You couldn't rely on this thing to get across the river, so you wouldn't live over here, but it was good enough to transport the food. And it was a pretty quiet existence. I mean, the, you know, the only the only little uh, blip on the screen was a little thing called the American <laughs> Revolution. Right. Well, and of course, the first great battle of the Revolution was here in Brooklyn. And here were the British with over 20,000 troops, and they just annihilated the colonist forces. And the colonist forces, thank goodness, for two days of rain and heavy fog, the night of August 29 and August 30, 1776, because Washington brilliantly, they didn't say anything out loud, it was all whispered, and they literally came right down old Fulton Street with over 9,500 men and their equipment and put them on little boats, tiny boats, rowboats, and overnight in the dark, deep fog, they escaped to Manhattan Island. And if it hadn't been for that, very possibly the revolution might have been over. So Washington pulled that off. Luckily, okay. otherwise we'd be having tea with British accents. <laughs> okay. Now, now this, you see, you're talking about transportation. Now, I know this looks like a quaint old print, but actually this is a view of the Brooklyn Ferry going high tech. In 1814, Robert Fulton put into operation his new mechanized ferry, a steam-driven ferry, and totally revolutionized the relationship of Brooklyn to New York. Now you knew you could get home after work, regardless of what the wind was like. And so as a result, Brooklyn Heights became the first upper-class suburb of New York City. The wealthy loved the isolation of it, but this ferry meant they could get to work in the morning and come back in the evening. And it, it, it just started growing from there. Now, so many people wanted to live on this side of the river because it was so much better, the living, that they put in it at Most least... Stinky? Well, you know, crowded and noisy. You know New York, it's always the same. So they wanted to move to this side of the river. There's a half a dozen ferries running across the East River by the 1850s. The, the, the crowds on the ferries are getting worse and worse. People remember in those days had to walk to the ferry. I mean, not everybody had, could afford a carriage. It wasn't like today where everybody has a car. So how far could you live? Yeah. Well, they started in the 1850s putting into effect these, these horse car lines. And the horse car lines spread out into the hinterlands of Brooklyn. And it allowed a whole new ring of neighborhoods to be built. This is a wonderful map from the 18th century. Neighborhoods like Fort Greene, Prospect Heights, Borum Hill, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens. This whole ring of the Brooklyn Brownstone Belt was built because of those horse car lines feeding the Brooklyn Ferry. By the 1860s, there were 50 million people crossing the East River every year. They could not put in another ferry line. They couldn't put another person on the ferries. This was the Fulton Ferry Terminal, built in the 1870s. Uh, it was a, a wonderful building. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, it does look like the old Grand Central exactly. Terminal. Absolutely. And there is the future in back of it. Because they could not figure out how to get people across the river efficiently. I'm sure somebody finally said, hey, let's build a bridge. Oh, so they did. Magnificent bridge, which, by the way, has been the subject of poems, of, of 
art and lithography, wonderful books. The Brooklyn Bridge, of course, has been completed, and you see how close the uh, ferry terminal was to that bridge. Mm -hmm. And now, now, even with the bridge and the L train lines, by the 1890s, the bridge is at capacity. The ferries are still at capacity. They're still ferrying 50 million people across the river. So what next? The only thing to do, join with New York, get another two bridges built, the Williamsburg in 1903, the Manhattan in 1909, but even more importantly, under the river in 1908, an incredible engineering feat, they build the first subway tunnel to Brooklyn, the IRT, there's Father Nick and Miss Brooklyn <laughs> shaking hands. Uh, actually, it was more a marriage of convenience than one made in heaven. You know, Brooklyn was uh, drags, uh, screaming into that relationship. But as a result of those subway tunnels being built, the first one only went to downtown Brooklyn. But in 1920, the subways literally, with, with three more tunnels built, with two lines coming over the uh, Manhattan and Williamsburg bridges, they fanned out into all of Brooklyn. And it meant that then you probably could go back to enjoying that Fulton Ferry ride across to New York the way that Walt Whitman did back in the 19th century. And he made that trip so many times and loved the ferry so much and, of course, wrote, you know, wrote the great poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And here's just a little excerpt from it. Uh, flow on river, flow with the flood tide, and ebb with the ebb tide, frolic on crested and scallop-edged waves, Gorgeous clouds of the sunset drench with your splendor me or the men and women generations after me. Cross from shore to shore, countless crowds of passengers. Stand up, tall masts of Manahatta. Stand up, beautiful hills of Brooklyn. And it does feel like we're standing on a hill. Well, actually, David, we're on kind of a shelf that has been cantilevered out from one of the main hills of Brooklyn. This is the hill that Brooklyn Heights is built on. It's, it's an incredible neighborhood. When Robert Fulton created that ferry, that high-tech ferry in 1814, and people knew they could actually get home in the evening, that's when this neighborhood became the first elite neighborhood on this side of the river. Uh, from then, in, in the 1810s until 1883, when the Brooklyn Bridge opened up, this neighborhood was it. And all of the styles of that period of the 19th century you can see in this neighborhood. Um, here is a, a view in the mid-19th century. Actually, this is the end of Montague Street, which is only a couple of blocks up. Oh, yeah. uh, this was, you know, this was the Pierpont Estate. And they decided to develop this in the 1850s, put in a ferry between Montague Street and Wall Street. And as a result, they were able to build these wonderful row houses, townhouses, this freestanding house, that's the Pierpont's own house. It came down when the BQE was built. These two houses, oh, they're magnificent. BQE. Oh, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, you know, but we, we don't like to say that with too much respect. Um, but these houses have beautiful iron and glass verandas in back of them. And you know, these houses were in a number of movies, including Prisoner's Honor and Moonstruck. What a view gorgeous view and they had an access in those years to these wonderful greenhouses that actually would have been around where we are but slightly below us they were accessed by those staircases now this neighborhood after the bridge opened a little bit too in the middle of everything the elite move out to crown heights clinton hill park slope uh, you know this neighborhood gradually kind of went downhill so who, who so who moved in well by the 1940s this was a low rent district in two groups moved in in that period. One was the Arabic community. They used to live over in Manhattan on the Lower West Side. Their neighborhood was being destroyed because of urban renewal. They moved over here. They set up their shops on Atlantic Avenue, which is still one of the great ethnic shopping streets of New York. What was the other group? The artists and the writers. To the north of us, 7 mid Street, which is now gone. That's where W.H. Auden lived. Benjamin Britten lived there as well. Carson McCullers. And through that house in the 1940s when they lived there, you had people like Gypsy Rose Lee, Lenny Bernstein, Salvador Dali. In the same breath, Bernstein and Gypsy Rose Lee. Funny. But also great writers live. Arthur Miller uh, lived over here, I know, and wrote here. So did Norman Mailer, among others. So. And, and Truman Capote. Oh, this was really a mecca for the writers in the 1940s and 50s. Now, here's a picture of this promenade when it was practically brand new. You can tell not only by the clothing, look at that pre-World War II skyline. The, the reason why this is here, it's, it's one of the classic fights that a neighborhood had here in New York. Robert Moses, 
right. you know, the great builder of New York of the mid 20th century. He thought he was related to the original Moses. He wanted to build the BQE right through the middle of Brooklyn Heights and destroy the neighborhood. The Brooklyn Heights Association fought him and forced him, and it was one of the few times people won against Robert Moses, forced him to put the expressway on the edge of the neighborhood, triple deck it, give us this promenade. So we're on the actually the top deck, is yes, that? Yes, we are. And then that Brooklyn, that same Brooklyn Heights Association, in the 1960s, they lobbied to make this neighborhood the first landmark designated district in New York City. And it's why, to this day, Brooklyn Heights, it's amazing. It's right across from Manhattan. It still has the same townhouses that were built in the 19th century. You know, it's, it's a prototypical Brooklyn neighborhood. It's a neighborhood of homes and churches. Brooklyn's been called the city of churches. You've selected this Plymouth church here in Brooklyn Heights to show us specifically why this church. Because, David, when this church was built in 1850, it was one of the most powerful churches politically, not only in the city of Brooklyn, but in the entire metropolitan area. This is what it looks like when it was opened in 1850, a simple, plain, it's a Congregationalist church. People forget the Congregationalists. They're the Puritans. And independent, too. A completely independent, each congregation. And it's why it's called Plymouth Church. As a matter of fact, it's called Plymouth Church of the Pilgrims. It's a combination of two churches from years ago. But this is why a little piece of Plymouth Rock is just a few feet away. And, and when they built this simple, plain meeting house, you came here to hear the Word of God, read your Bible and hear the Word of God. It's probably one of the first churches built, and I think Beecher, Henry Ward Beecher had a lot to do with this. It was built in a horseshoe shape so that everyone faced the preacher, eyes were on the preacher, energy going into the preacher, energy going out into the congregation. What was he like? Oh, Beecher was an amazing man, I think. He had a tremendous charisma. I think you could compare him to, oh, a Billy Graham, uh, one of the more popular televangelists of, of today. He had, Beecher had an amazing quality. He understood the media. He understood how to use it for his purposes. And they were always morally pure purposes. He, uh, he first of all, his family was amazing. He came from a preaching family. He had two sisters who were brilliant. You had uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was famous for Uncle Tom's Cabin. She was also an abolitionist. She was a suffragette. Her sister, Catherine Beecher, was famous. She uh, started five different institutions for higher education for women. And he was very supportive of their efforts regarding women and suffrage. Right? Very much right? so, very much so. I mean, you know, he loved the ladies in many different ways, but I must say, he also respected them for their intelligence and he fought for their rights in the public arena. How significant was he as an abolitionist? He was, a, he was very famous as an abolitionist. He's probably most famous today for his abolitionism. Remember when the Congregationalists built these churches, these plain, simple churches, it was meant to, to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And just as the plainness of this church did that, uh, yes, originally there were white glass windows. Today, you have these beautiful stained glass windows. Uh, actually, they're, they're principally historical views of the history of the Reformation. As opposed to religious or ecclesiastical. Yes. But originally, this was all very plain, and it reflected that idea of the kingdom of God. And this is why I think Mr. Beecher, who we see right here, I think this is why he and his congregation moved so naturally towards the stand of abolitionism. How much was music part of all this? Well, when this church opened originally, there was no organ. But in 1865, Beecher put in this magnificent organ that you hear in back of us, that we see right over here. That mahogany case and those, those front pipes are from 1865. Who's Pinky? Well, Beecher, who had this, this wonderful instinct for media, he realized, how, how do I bring the tragedy of slavery to the public? So he hit on the idea of having slave auctions. Remember that in those days, when a slave escaped from the South, they, did, they weren't free just because they walked into the North, into a free state. Uh, according to the federal government, uh, according to laws begun in the 1790s, fugitive slave laws, a, uh, a slave run away from the South was considered a felon in the North as if he, he or she was a murderer. So whoever helped them was at big risk. Absolutely, unless that slave had been bought and freed by his owner. So what did Beecher do? He instituted these slave auctions where on a Sunday he would bring 
a slave, he had a, arranged to bring a slave from the South, and then in a dramatic auction, he would raise money from the congregation. Right here. Absolutely, they, they, would, they would give money, they would give rings, they would give jewelry. On the spot, they would raise the money to buy the slave, and then Beecher, in a dramatic gesture, as the owner of the slave, would free the slave. And the most famous of those auctions was for this young girl, Pinky, who, this was back, of course, in the mid-19th century, who was freed by Beecher as an old lady in her 80s, in the 1920s, she came back to this church and sat in the very pew where she was that day in the 1850s. Now, how involved were other parishioners in this whole process of trying to get slaves out of the South? Basically, this church was a safe house in the Underground Railroad. It was more than a safe house. It was called the Grand Central Depot of the Underground Railroad. I mean, we're underground now, Barry, but of course, Underground Railroad wasn't underground for the most part, nor was it a railroad. Well, well here they took that term literally. You, you know, this looks like the original 1850s construction. Huh. These timbers. Yeah, I think huh. so. Yeah. This is what I wanted to show you, David. Now, remember, you're right, underground was a metaphor, but you know why? Because everything was done in secret. Well. Uh, that's why we have no idea really where all these tunnels were and these passages. Nobody ever wrote it down. They didn't want to get caught. Now, the railroad part, that also was a metaphor, but it's fascinating. They used railroad terms probably as code so that, uh, yeah, there were railroad lines. Mm -hmm. A safe house was called a station. Hmm. Uh, the person who helped you was a conductor. And by the way, those conductors could be free blacks, uh, white abolitionists, other people concerned about this. Anybody who wanted out. Anybody who would stick their neck out right. for a fugitive slave. Right. And, the, and the slaves themselves were called baggage or freight. Okay. Now, that gray stone is, is most likely the original foundation stone of the church. Looks like Manhattan schist. Uh, there is, that archwork could very well be also from the 1850s. That's but supportive, just, right? Yes, that, that, would, that would be a supportive arch. Yep. But that, that brickwork, that, that looks brand new or relatively new. And it could very well have filled in an opening since we are facing the East River. Behind that brickwork could be. It's, it's possible that there is a tunnel that led to the East River through which those slaves came. Boy, that is some massive bridge. It's an amazing piece of construction. That is the approach to the Manhattan Bridge in its massiveness, in its neoclassical uh, magnificence. It reminds me of 18th century Piranesi's work. Ah. in Rome. Amazing piece of work. Now, Dumbo? Yeah, well, that's why they call this Dumbo. It's down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Oh, sure. But it feels like, what, the late 1800s? Look at the stone well, streets. Well, this, this, the Belgian block, the factories, this is all from the 19th century. This is the heart of the old Brooklyn industrial waterfront of the 19th century that went all the way from Greenpoint down to Red Hook. Dumbo's right in the middle of it. Includes a little area, an old Irish town called Vinegar Hill. Yeah. This is what this area looked like. They were looking down Washington Street towards the Manhattan Bridge. I want it great. And isn't that it's 1920s, obviously. These factories were, were packed with people. And of course, over the years, the factories emptied out a bit. Now, in the last 20 years, artists have moved in. They've been pushed out by the high rents of Soho, Tribeca, and the downtown Manhattan Loft District. And they're they basically have tried to turn this whole waterfront along the East River, Brooklyn's East River waterfront, into a left bank. So how much have they accomplished that? Well, it's amazing how many galleries are here, how many artists are here. Thousands. I mean, we're talking the whole... Oh, along yes, the along this whole thousands. waterfront. It is amazing. Yeah. But you know, you look around and you think, well, who would want these buildings anyway? You've got not just the artists. You've got manufacturers who are also leaving Manhattan. This, is, this could be their last stand in New York if they don't get these buildings. And then in back of everybody, you have these upscale developers who are hoping to take these buildings and turn this entire waterfront into a new Soho. So the prices are going to shoot Million up. Million dollar lofts, lots of coffee bars. Right. Now, here are the works of two artists who live down here. Well, I, I think it's amazing how the artists here take their inspiration, very much like for Francis Guy did when it was just a village, but they take their inspiration from what they see around us. Now, these are two different artists on the left. That's Nicholas Evans Cato a site right near here. There's the Manhattan Bridge. In fact, there is the part of the approach we were looking at. And the same view, if you look on the right, same view, it's Ed Rath, another artist, a completely different vision. It is really, this is what artists do. It's their vision. The 
world-famous Brooklyn Navy Yard, and what a piece of history this is, the first dry dock built in America. Wow. Oh, this is a beautiful piece of work. Actually, there's water in it now because it's waiting for the next ship to come in to be repaired. It was built between 1840 and 51. It's all granite and flagstone, and it has never needed to be repaired, and it's still in use today. You know, this was built in that heroic era when America was building its first railroads, and it had to throw across the valleys and huge bridges tunnel through those mountain ranges of our continent, and this belongs to that heroic era of construction. It was part, of course, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Now, this, this is Wallabut Bay. The Brooklyn Navy Yard was, was built in, in what was originally Wallabut Bay. In Dutch, Wallabut means bend in the river. Back in the 1780s, it was a private shipbuilding yard, but in 1801, the feds, the federal government, took it over and turned it into, uh, officially, the New York Navy Yard, but everybody calls it the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and this is a very nice aerial shot of the Navy Yard today. You know, it's run by a, a private development corporation that's bringing businesses back. There are about 200 businesses here now with about 2,500 people working. And Dry Dock One, where we are, is just over here. And the Naval Hospital that we'll be speaking about, that's right over here. And this gives you an idea of some of the great ships. I mean, talk about celebrity ships. First, you had the Maine. This is actually the main when it was being constructed in the dry dock. Remember when this was blown up in Havana Harbor, this is what started the Spanish-American War. And then, of course, needless to say, the USS Brooklyn was being launched here. Now, this is what the Navy Yard looked like during World War II. There were 70,000 people working here, three ships around the clock. Amazing place. Rosie the Riveter was among them. When uh, first started. First time they really started doing construction work. And, you know, in those years, this is where they built the Arizona. Now a memorial, of course, in, in Pearl Harbor. Yes, and this is the Missouri. <laughs> this is when it's being launched. Here it is, just slipping into the water. Basically, it's going off into history because it was on this ship that the Japanese and Americans signed the peace treaty that ended World War II. Now here, in the northern quadrant of the Navy Yard is the old Naval Hospital. This building's gone, but the old hospital from the 1830s is still there. Beautiful granite building made out of the same material as, as this dry dock. Uh, wonderful Greek revival structure. Saw a lot of, uh, needless to say, very busy during the Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II. Here's a view of some of the wounded fellows from World War I and one of their nurses. And coming back to that 1850s print, What's beautiful about the print, it shows us the, this area of Brooklyn where we just were, the Dumbo area we've just seen, and we're about to go to the Williamsburg area north of the Navy Yard. Hey, we finally made it to an elevated train station. Oh, Thank you. This is how I grew up. I grew up on one of these trains. Really? Oh, this is my line. Is it? Hey, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I'm home. I mean, if we stay on this train that's coming and go that way, we'll wind up at your house? That's right. There's a right. plaque there now. <laughs> We're in Williamsburg. OK. Hey, Williamsburg, Billyburg, they call it today. Yeah, this is a wonderful print. I love this. I love these prints. These really shows you the relationship of New York on Manhattan Island with Brooklyn and Williamsburg on Long Island. Uh, by the way, there's Brooklyn City Hall, which we're going to be at in a short while. There's Wallabut Bay, which is the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We were just there. And there is Williamsburg, the independent city of Williamsburg. Now, remember, Williamsburg was not part of Brooklyn originally. Williamsburg profited from the growth of New York. Remember Brooklyn profited when New York was down at the tip of Manhattan? By the time the commercial district of New York moves up into the Four Lears Hook area, we call it the Lower East Side, 14th Street, Williamsburg profited from that and in fact became its own city in 1851. Huh. Look at that, surrounded by rural Bushwick Township. Now, Williamsburg gets swallowed up by Brooklyn in 1855, still remains though a very strong commercial district. The German immigrants, by the 1860s, they're living in what we call the Lower East Side, the East Village. A few of them must have taken a ferry over to Williamsburg, established a German community here, spills over into Bushwick. We're going to be visiting the brewery soon. Williamsburg, Bushwick, Ridgewood, Cypress Hills, the Brooklyn city line, that's the German district of Brooklyn, Kleine Deutschland. Oh. Then in the 1900s, the Jews do the same thing. They begin to live in the Lower East Side, the East Village area that right. we call today. 
and they have a different way of getting across the river. They and the Italians, they're all squeezed into the Lower East Side. Well, when that bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, opened in 1903, the Jews and the Italians spilled over the bridge. By the way, the Jews called it in Yiddish, Nyabrik. Which is? The new bridge. Compared to Brooklyn? That's, that's right. What, that, like that was the old bridge, all 15, 15 years, years old. Soon, yeah. <laughs> well, they come pouring over. The Jews move in here with the Italians, establish their community. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, uh, they, they lived here for about 50, 60 years. Today, you still have a very strong ethnic presence here. You have Hasidic Jews. Right. That's Orthodox There's Jewish sex. sex, yes, several of them. Right. You still have the Italians, by the way. You know, every July they have that uh, Giglio celebration where they, where they have it? that big tower. They're holding it up, not me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I have other specialties. Duh. <laughs> and uh, oh, you have you have a Latino district here since the 1950s. You have Polish people here as well. But today, Williamsburg is being put on the map by a new population moving into the north side, Bedford Avenue, right across from 14th Street, right in this area. You are getting the new kids from the East Village bringing a whole new life to Williamsburg. Creative and Unbelievable, young and showing you that Brooklyn is no longer what it was like in the 20th century when it was overshadowed oh, by the big wow. kahuna across the way. They are These great buildings. This Williamsburg is a place that people come to from all over. It joins with Park Slope, Fort Greene, uh, Cobble Hill, and Carroll Gardens. Uh, these areas are all attracting people from all over. And you know, if we were down in the streets of Broadway, it would still look like that today. I'll be darned. And this, uh, in Brooklyn, so many celebrities, uh, famous people from every walk of life, born and raised here in Brooklyn, many of them in Williamsburg. And we're about to talk with one of them, the wonderful comedian and television producer, Alan King. Alan, how long since you have been here Actually, in this neighborhood? I, have, I don't think I've been on, in this neighborhood in well over 50 years. And this has just been in the last few minutes. What's it like? I'm driving here in the car. I started to choke up, and, I, and the driver thought there was something wrong with me. I kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I passed the school I, first school I went to. And I mean, it's just overwhelming. You know, people get so nostalgic about that era, but it was a tough life. No, I don't know. You know, I always said I didn't know I was poor until I got rich. I had the best time growing up here. What was it like? The streets were filled with kids. There were games, Johnny on a Pony, and you know, and you know, kick the can, and we had stickball games, not on the street, but on the side streets. And you know, when my kids were growing up, we used to have to put them in a station wagon to find them, to find playmates for them, you know? <laughs> Playdates. <laughs> Playdates. <laughs> right. These streets were, were filled with young people, and there was a candy store. It was called Cheap Simons and because everything cost a penny and they had a, a, a soda box a large soda box like a cooler in front and that's where i started where all the kids used to sit on a box and i used to tell them stories about wee willie i used to make up stories about this little guy so how old were you then? i was maybe six seven and uh, you grew up fast here oh. very fast because you know you were in a street and uh, everything was just so quick and, and and you wanted to get out you know my father my father and mother were immigrants and my father said you, you don't you know the greatest thing my father ever said <laughs> i'm sorry that's okay Woo. he said i'd leave you nothing no shoes to fill no shadows to follow. I'm nothing, my father said. And you can be somebody. See these buildings? Right. Mothers, they had eyes. They could see around corners. Always. I mean it. Yes. Now, th the big thing, they used to look out of those windows. My mother would have a little pillow, and she'd just watch oh. the trap. You know, my father says she's watching for accidents. What else could you see? You know, and my mother would be looking out the window and I'd be around the corner and I was already, you know, with my hands and all of a sudden, Erwin, I was, I was Erwin. Er, and I mean, you could hear it for a quarter of a mile and you'd be ready. Oh, my mother, how did she know I was fighting? You know? I mean, how, this is... How long's that been there? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Luger's been there? Peter Luger's 
This is not a commercial, obviously, because they don't need it. This is one of the great steakhouses in the world. When I was a kid, at lunchtime, you could be Wall Street moguls at the time. You could get in their limousines and come. It took 15 minutes over the Williamsburg Bridge. And from about 12 till about 2, this entire street was filled with limousines, with putties, men, you know, with the, with the caps. And I used to take my lunch. It was always in a brown paper bag, an egg salad sandwich on a Kaiser roll. And I'd take it, and my friends would wave on. They would, I'd say, I'm going over to, is she going to look in our restaurant again? And I used to stand on a little box, and I used to look in and see those porterhouse steaks, and the hash browns, with, you know, and the onion, fried onions as big as your fist. And I always used to say, I said, someday I'm going to be able to afford to eat steak at Peter Luger's. And now I can buy Peter Luger's, and I can't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> no red meat, you know. <laughs> I was raised on South 2nd between Rodney and Marcy. And the building doesn't exist anymore. We used to do a joke, you know, we used to say, you know, the building that I was born in had a sign in front of it said to be torn down. <laughs> How many people were there living in your apartment and how big was it? What was that like? The, in the original apartment, there was eight children, my mother, my father, and an uncle. We, he wasn't an uncle, he was a boarder. And used to, you know, I thought everybody slept three, four in a bed. What fun it was, too, you know. <laughs> Actually, you know, it was really cool hanging out, you know. So we were, uh, we had, we were 10, 12 people in a three-room apartment. But there was food on the table. I don't know how my mother did it. There was a clean shirt, even if my father had to turn the collar over, you know. Clean shirt, food on the table, and a sense of dignity. That being poor had nothing to do with having dignity. West Nassau Meat Market on Manhattan Avenue. Do you know anything about this food? No. Okay. Not me. Let me give it a shot. May I have a half a kielbasa, please? Um, what kind of kielbasa do you want? Uh-oh. The best one, what do we have? What, uh, how many kinds are there? Oh, it's many kinds. By I prefer Kayana. What's Kayana? Kayana means that it's the big chunky meat inside. Yeah. It's the leaden kielbasa. The most popular That sounds perfect. <laughs> Thank you. A half. Okay. Barry, you're and supposed we... to know about this stuff. You're from New York. Um, I grew up in a kosher home. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Isn't this great? <laughs> It's amazing. It's I like mean, being... it's feel, it feels like Eastern Europe. Well, I mean, we're like we're, on, we're in Krakow on the East River. We're, we're right across the East River from Manhattan. In fact, we're right across from Manhattan's east side between 14th and 30th Street. We're in Greenpoint, the northernmost point in Brooklyn. And this neighborhood has been a Polish neighborhood for generations. Polish is the lingua franca of the neighborhood. You know, this was originally part of that town of Bushwick, like Williamsburg. Yeah. By the time it was all annexed to Brooklyn in 1855, that waterfront was already industrializing. And what's interesting is, of all the neighborhoods we're looking at, we looked at Brooklyn Heights. We're going to be looking at the other great brownstone neighborhoods. They were all built for commuters, middle-class commuters going to Wall Street. But not Greenpoint. Not Greenpoint. Uh -uh. From the very beginning in the middle of the 19th century, this neighborhood was built for the people who worked over on that waterfront. In fact, a number of the houses here in Greenpoint were probably built by people who worked on the waterfront. And it still has that sense of insularity, that, that sense, do you know Manhattan these days? God, it's so homogenized. There's so many yuppies with, with, with different backgrounds. <laughs> That's all it is. But here, if you go from here to Williamsburg to Bushwick to the Heights or what, oh, what's the difference? Oh, the, the differences in language, culture, class, religion. You know, when I look here up and down Manhattan Avenue, and this is a real main street, a real shopping street, its skyline is dominated by the church spires of Greenpoint. Like every Brooklyn neighborhood, it's houses and churches. They're St. Anthony's of Padua, the Roman Catholic Church for the neighborhood. And by the way, there's a picture of the Pope oh, in, in the meat well, market. Oh, well, of course, they're you know, Polish. Krakow, yeah, and yeah. the other great church of the neighborhood, 
the Russian Orthodox Cathedral of the Transfiguration at McCarran Park with its onion domes dominating the skyline. You know, when I, when I think about it, you go from Greenpoint, we've just been in Williamsburg, we're now gonna go to Bushwick. It's like three different states out of the Holy Roman Empire. When he became a grown-up, Steve Hindy decided he wanted to be a brewer, and a brewer he is. He owns a brewery, the Brooklyn Brewery. Steve, how's it going? It's going great. Barry, what part of Brooklyn are we in? Well, we're in North Brooklyn. Actually, we're in what was the Kleine Deutschland, the, the, the little Germany of Victorian Brooklyn. The Irish and the Germans came to America in the 1840s, 50s. They settled first here in New York, in Manhattan. Then they crossed the river, discovered Brooklyn. Well, the Germans came into Brooklyn through Williamsburg. And by the 1840s, 50s, 60s, they're spilling over from Williamsburg into Bushwick, into Ridgewood, into Cypress Hills, and across the city line into Queens. Needless to say, wherever the Germans went, there was beer. So Steve, why are we standing right here at this spot? Well, 100 years ago, there were 45 breweries here in, in Brooklyn. And we're here on Meserol Street uh, in the midst of what was known as Brewer's Row. There's a 12 square block area here that had 11 breweries. And right there is the uh, remains of what was the largest brewery on Brewer's Row, the Otto Huber Brewing Company, which was built here in 1875. It was run by the Huber family up till 1916 when she, it was purchased by a Rus Russian immigrant named uh, Edward B. Hittleman, and he developed the Goldenrod Hittleman Brewery. So we're right along here and yeah, we're right here. Here was the old brew house, the tall building there. Uh, these uh, buildings were all fermenting vessels. There's the old ice plant. Tell me how they did this in those days before refrigeration as we know it. Well, as in Germany, uh, exactly the way beer was brewed in Europe at that time, uh, it had to be lagered or stored uh, to be perfected. And there are massive caverns beneath this brewery this, uh, oh my goodness. this is uh, the first of a whole honeycomb of cellars. I've been in about a, a dozen of them. And uh, this is where the lagering tanks uh, held the beer to allow it to clarify and, and condition. German lager beer has to be conditioned at very cool temperatures. So these caves uh, gave the brewers a very, very steady temperature year round. How would the beer get down here? Well, it was brewed up at street level, and then it would be pumped down here in these pipes, you can see. Some of the pipes were probably for uh, refrigeration to maintain the temperature probably in the 40s, and some were to bring the beer down into the uh, lagering tanks. Now, are these caves, there were loads of these caves. Oh, yes, this network extends, I've been in about 12 of them, and I think it extends way beyond that. Uh, there are actually some very large ones off to this side, if you want to have a look. Careful. Oh, they could have stored enough beer in here for half of Germany. Well, now we're back in this beautiful park, which is really close to the Brooklyn Academy of Music, but originally, of course, during the Revolution, uh, this was one of those colonists' forts, Fort Putnam, that the colonists had to abandon when the British pushed the colonists off the island. Uh, but now, of course, it's both a memorial and this beautiful park. Well, actually, it's interesting, David. The guy who proposed this park was Walt Whitman when he was editor of the Brooklyn Eagle over on Fulton Street. It was the 1840s. This actually was a poor district back then. He thought it would be nice to have a park for the poor people. It was built in the 1850s. By the 1860s, horse car lines from the ferry dock are bringing wealthier people into the area. So they brought in Olmsted and Vox to redo the park, give it their, you know, Olmsted and Vox did Prospect Park, the parkways in Central Park. And they were the ones who proposed that a memorial finally be built to the poor soldiers, the American soldiers who had been in the prison ships in Wallopit Bay. We are uphill from the old Wallopit Bay, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and during the Revolutionary War, remember the British occupied all of the New York metropolitan area. They had thousands of Yank prisoners. They the didn't whole know revolution, what to do. yeah. They didn't know what to do with them. So they put them in ships like that. That's the Jersey. They were anchored out in Wallopit Bay, and as these guys died because the conditions were horrible, the British would just throw them off the ships, throw the bodies off the ships, and over the years that followed, the decades that followed, the remains would just wash up on the shores of what became the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
Well, by the 1860s, uh, when this neighborhood began to gentrify and this park was redone by Olmsted and Vox, Olmsted and Vox proposed that a memorial be built for these guys. It took a while for people to get the money, get out all the agreements, but finally by the 1900s, they hired McKim, Mead, and White, that's Charles McKim and Stanford White, who designed this spectacular memorial, very simple, grand, very quiet. The remains, or at least some of the remains of those soldiers, are in this vault, but up the steps is what some people think is the tallest Doric column in the world, topped by a brazier, by the way, which originally had an eternal flame. Now, that column can be seen for miles around, but especially from the heart of downtown Brooklyn, and it visually anchors this Fort Greene neighborhood to the downtown area. Barry, here we are in Bed-Stuy, Bedford, Stuyvesant. To watch and listen to television, you would think that this entire area was nothing but what? Crime and, 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 and well, this projects. Is, this or... is what makes me so angry, and that's why too often you can't believe what you read or hear or see in the media. Now, we're, we're on Bainbridge Street in Bedford, Stuyvesant. We're, we're just further east down the Fulton Road, down the Ferry Road from Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, where we just were. This was, after all, the breadbasket. These were the farms of 17th and 18th century Brooklyn that fed New York. But that rural quiet is going to be broken in 1883 when the Brooklyn Bridge was built. Brooklyn built its elevated railroad lines. One of them came down here, Fulton Street, the Spider Lady of Fulton Street. So people could get here to settle it? I yeah, mean. they were the expressways of their day. Right. And that's what led to the development of this neighborhood, Bedford and Stuyvesant Heights, were built up in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s. This was the zenith of the independent city of Brooklyn, the great Victorian city of Brooklyn. Before it became part of New York. Yes, yeah. before the, the dissolution. And, and these, these neighborhoods, uh, I mean, they're, they're contemporary with Back Bay Boston, with Park Slope, uh, with, with Clinton Hill, with, with Sugar Hill in, in Hamilton oh. Heights, where we were in Harlem. They were built with quality, and the styles of the houses range from oh, all of the different arts and crafts styles, the Neo-Romanesque, the American Queen Anne, right around the corner on Stuyvesant Avenue, beautiful Beaux-Arts revival houses in Neo-Georgian and French Renaissance from the 1900s. F.W. Woolworth lived only a few blocks away. That's the kind of people who lived here. Now, by the 1920s, the black families, African-American families, are beginning to move into the neighborhood. By the 1930s, Duke Ellington's A-Train connects Bedford-Stuyvesant with Harlem. And by the 1950s and 60s, this became known as the second largest black community in the United States. After South Side Chicago? Yes, that's the largest. This house was built in 1892. And it's an extraordinary home. Actually, the developer of the block lived in this house. They were so proud of what they built. They lived where they built. Right. This is an amazing house from this arts and crafts era. You notice the wood framing? It's a neo grec style, which actually is an early modern style. Very light, very skeletal, very open. Yeah, you can see through and you feel well, the space, right? When you walk in right? the house, absolutely. You felt it when you walked in. Yeah. You, you, you feel the full sweep of the house through the three parlors to the stained glass windows in the back, which, by the way, operate as French doors to the sure. back garden. The flooring, beautiful parquet flooring uh, with these uh, inlaid borders. The arched arts and crafts fireplace has beautiful uh, tile work. That, by the way, is a gas bed fire from the original days. And the reeds said, by the way, there are nine fireplaces in this house. What fascinates me is that the gas plumb lines in this house still operate. I, I'm, I'm fascinated gas by that. Uh, yeah. Ingrid Bergman. I mean, this is stepping back into history, but we're here today. Now, the painted fabric the panels, the Victorian romantic imagery on the walls, you very rarely see that in these houses. On either side of the overmantel, the staircase uh, with that beautiful spindle work on the balustrade to show you the beauty of woodworking. And the woodwork goes through the whole house, it's oh, it, right? yes, oh yes. I mean, you know, they didn't believe in just leaving something bare because nobody would see it. There was quality everywhere. believe we're in New York City. Now, this is the remains of Weeksville. You see, we're on a ridge, just north of Crown Heights, right by Bedford-Stuyvesant, just a few blocks, actually, from where we just were. Right. Now, back in the 1827, New York State freed the blacks. And in the 1830s and 40s, 
free African Americans began to settle in this area, they established certain towns like Carville and Weeksville, where we are. This little town was built along a road. Actually, we are at the edge of what was a road. Hunterfly Road was one of the old 18th, 19th century country roads. And these towns were full, flourishing towns. By the way, the whites in those days used to pejoratively refer to this as Crow Heights. Mm -hmm. But these were working and middle-class blacks, free African-Americans, and it's, it's almost miraculous that these buildings still remain. And these were built when? Well, they would date to the 1840s, 50s, 60s, so they predate just about everything else around here. When these were built, Fulton Street was the ferry road. These were all farms, and by the way, most of those farms were Dutch owned, but before slavery was abolished, it was African slaves and indentured European servants that worked those farms. So the blacks have been in this area, well, really since the Europeans arrived. Joan Maynard is Director Emeritus of Weeksville. Joan, it's a pleasure. My pleasure, dear. Thank you very much. Now tell me, what is this a preservation organization? What, are the, what is the value of these buildings today and what are you doing with them? Well, as someone just said, it's quite miraculous that they do exist. They do exist and they, they give uh, credibility to this history, this profound history of African Americans in this place we now call New York City. Um, I think it's, it's miraculous and wonderful because it allows us to use the telling the story as education to tell the children who they are, how they got here, and how important they are, African-American children in particular, in the, the existence of New York City. This is where people um, who are trying to make a new way for themselves managed to come. James Weeks, for whom Weeksville is named, had come from Virginia, and he managed to buy property here in the area by 1838. But you have to remember, as you said, slavery only ended uh, in 1827 in New York State, and there wasn't any welcome wagons or anything out at the time. And the, the whole idea is that here is somebody who is actually working across the river. He's working in what is now uh, we call the South Street Seaport Museum. And it wasn't a museum then, it was a place he did hard work. And, and there wasn't any subway, there wasn't any bridge. But he had to manage to bring himself uh, from work and come to Brooklyn every day. Well, you know, it was a penny on the ferry. But he managed to save money and managed to buy a piece of property here in, in what we now call Weeksville. These houses that we're looking at, were they built by the African-Americans who lived in them? We believe that this particular one was, was definitely had African-American influence. Joan, thank you. Well, I've enjoyed you all being here, and I want to thank you very much for coming and bringing a little taste of what I call history in Brooklyn. We're very, I'm very proud to be a Brooklynite, you know. Um, Brooklyn is a great place. I don't know if you know this, but um, the whole African diaspora has reassembled itself in Brooklyn, much more than any other place in the world. These are st statistics that we can, we can count on. And you can find people here in this, right here in Brooklyn, speaking Ga, and Twi, and they're speaking Creole, and they're speaking Papiamento, and they're speaking English and French, people of African descent. So in some miraculous way, and I keep using this word <laughs> miraculous, people have reassembled themselves. So it, it's, a, it's a learning center. Weeksville is a learning center, not only for us, but for the people uh, all over New York. People should be glad that Brooklyn is New York. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> is this Athens City Hall? Well, they wanted it to be, you know, this Greek Revival City Hall, and it is City Hall. This is Brooklyn's City Hall. I mean, they call it Borough Hall today, but to me, it's always City Hall. And Brooklyn started down there at the Fulton Ferry Landing. Remember Francis Guy's Little Village? Right, right that down the That was the hill. 1810s, right down the hill. And by the 1830s, Brooklyn has become a city, a real city, in 1834. New York did not like that. Why not? Well, New York wanted to be the only city around here. Like now. Yeah. They never <laughs> changed those Manhattan people. Yeah. So Brooklyn put its city hall way up on the hill overlooking the commercial district. Here's what it looks like. Uh, and this is probably from the 1850s when it was brand new. It, it opened in 1849. We're standing right here, so that means that's what this area looked like. This is probably the 1850s, maybe the 1860s. Now here, is when Brooklyn builds its elevated railroad system that fans out through Brooklyn, bringing all these people from Kings County into downtown Brooklyn. What happened to the cupola? Well, 
we know that this is an 1897 photograph. That cupola burned in 1896, so we know this is the year after that. By the way, there's a beautiful Supreme Court building from the 1840s, also in the Greek Revival style. It's a shame they tore it down in the 1960s. Uh, now, here we are. It's got to be 1899, uh, 1900, because you notice they just put back the cupola. But this is a new Beaux-Arts, flamboyant Beaux-Arts cupola. There's the Spider Lady of Fulton Street, the L train, on its way to Bedford, Stuyvesant Heights, and East New York. Uh, there's the old, wonderful old uh, Supreme Court building. In this area, Abraham and Strauss went up eventually. Abraham and Strauss was one of the great book of department stores. And in fact, it's still there, the various buildings. It's now a Macy's. Uh, then, right down the block from what is now Abraham and what was Abraham and Strauss, the Dime Savings Bank went up in 1906. This is what it looked like after a 1931 expansion. Wow. Magnificent, polygonal, Beaux-Arts Bank, shallow dome. What's it like inside? Oh, fabulous. Twelve German red marble columns hold up that uh, cupola. By the way, the Corinthian capitals are gilded. They have big mercury dimes in among the Corinthian leaves. Very American idea. You know, by the way, Brooklyn had great oyster houses. Now, why were there so many? Oh, of them? New York was famous for its oysters. You know, they said in the 19th century, New York oysters could be as big as dinner plates. Well, those oysters are gone, but there's one great oyster house still here. It's Gage and Tolner's. Which is, people come from all over. All over. And it's right, it's just a couple of minutes away from right. here. 1892 interior is still intact. They've really kept it. Oh. Maintained it, haven't they, and restored in, it? In 1996, they restored the whole interior. Yeah. That's Lincrusta on the walls. That was a that was an imitation leather that they liked to use back then. It's framed in cherry wood. And by the way, the cut glass and brass chandeliers, they were just replumbed. Yeah. So you can actually have your dinner by gaslight. Hey, Barry. How about a little uh, friendly game of horse? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Maybe a little round the world? Want okay. to try that? Absolutely. You ready? Oh, I'm game. I'm always game. Do you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely not. That's what I thought. Look, what is this? A basketball court or an arena? What is this? Actually, this is a New York archaeology. <laughs> if it was Rome, it would be the Forum. It's New York. It's one of the great movie palaces of the 1920s. I mean, this may be Long Island University's basketball court and gymnasium today, but back in 1928, this was built as the Brooklyn Paramount. It was 4,000 seats in here. It was basically what Louis XIV would have built if he ever had a movie palace. It, when it was built, that meant there were 25,000 seats within a few blocks of DeKalb, Fulton, and Flatbush, which is where we are. This was the Times Square of downtown 25,000? Yes, there were. You had the Albi a couple of blocks down. You had, uh, oh, the Fox was right across the street. Uh, you had the Majestic right around the corner, which has a whole new life. I mean, this place was hopping. Okay. Look at this. These were wonderful theaters. And you know, David, it really shows that you... That does remind you a little of Paramount in New York. I mean, yes, that's, that's right. That's right. When you came into the theater, all of this splendor for the 25 cents you just paid at the door. And then, look at that. Oh, that proscenium. This is... Actually, you still have a good half of it left. Yeah. It was just a magnificent place. Fabulous. And these, these places pulled in... I mean, you can imagine the thousands of people that came through this part of downtown Brooklyn. But you know, these theaters opened up and within a few years, you had the Depression, you had the war, and after the war, you had television. And they were on their knees. I mean, these great theaters, for all the time and effort, they lasted 20 years. So how to fill them up and make them pay? They, they, they couldn't figure out what to do. Comes 1955, this theater, and the one across the street, the Fox, they were saved by this guy and his partner, it was Alan Freed. This is Alan Freed, his partner, Murray the K. Murray the K was a music promoter. Alan Freed was a local DJ. And they brought to the Brooklyn Paramount and to the Fox, they brought rock and roll. This is really, I think you can say this is where rock and roll really was brought to New York. It was 1955. You know, if you had explained to us, I mean, I'm a white kid in the North. If you explained to me where rock and roll was, I'd tell you it was hillbilly music. But then we heard it. Right. And once we heard it, Rock and roll was forever. Look at this, four tenors. Oh, I don't know which group that is. Oh, there's Alan Freed with one of the groups on stage. They had, they must have had four or five shows a day. They had 4,000 kids per show. You can imagine what was going on here. You know, this was really a legend in the making. Look at that, the teenagers, the Kleptones, uh, Fats Domino, everybody was here. But this was a legend. 
that a lot of America didn't want to know about. The conservative right wing, the establishment, they didn't like any of this. Rock and roll to them was devil's music. And they hated the fact that people like Alan Freed was bringing it to the kids. And another thing they didn't like, remember, it was the 50s. Alan Freed was colorblind. He didn't care what color you were. If you liked his music and you bought a ticket, this was your place. So there were black and white kids in the audience. There were black and white kids on stage singing. It was a completely integrated atmosphere. You couldn't do that in the 50s. So they went after Alan Freed, and in the Paola scandals of the early 1960s, they really destroyed him. And it's a shame. He was one of the early martyrs to rock and roll. And you know, by the early 60s, the original kind of raunchy rock and roll, it was gone. The whole era was over. So Long Island University took over this place. Today, it's their gymnasium. But thank goodness for one of the people on their board, we still have the original 1928 Wurlitzer organ. Dave Kopp, what a magic sound, my gosh. Something, isn't it? It really is. From 1928. This is no. the this is the original it 1928 is. Wurlitzer Absolutely. for the theater. We're we're looking at one of the biggest theater organs that Wurlitzer built, um, one of the best surviving theater organs. It's the original organ in the original building, which is a rare combination. And among people who like theater organ, that's considered a a very special place. Now, what was the purpose originally when when they built organs like this? What was the purpose? About 1915, the whole idea of an organ that imitated an orchestra was created. And the purpose was to substitute for an orchestra in a movie theater showing silent movies so that you had music with your silent movies that was more than just a piano player. You actually had an organ that sounded like an orchestra or a pit band. Could you demonstrate some of the sounds that you mentioned earlier, the orchestral sounds sure. and how that works? Well, everything from a glockenspiel to a grand piano. And when I say a piano, that's a real piano up there that's being played from the keyboard. And all of the percussion instruments, you know, a, a tambourine, snare drum. Dave, would you play us out? Sure. Please? Street to Juniors at the corner of DeKalb and Flatbush Avenue from the Paramount, and we're sitting with Alan and Kevin Rosen, who are the third generation to run Juniors Restaurant, or what was Juniors, and prior to that, though, Alan, prior to Juniors, what was it? Well, my grandfather in the, in the early in the early 1900s was a soda jerk at Marcioni's on the Lower East Side, and his mother made him squirrel away a nickel every week, and by the time he was 22 years old, he bought a half interest in a soda shop and renamed it uh, the Enduro. He then came here with his bride-to-be Ruth at that, at that point and said, this is where I'm gonna open up the next Enduro. And she looked at him and she said, it's a morgue around here, you gotta be crazy. And he said, sweetheart, if I listen to you, we'll be, we'll be wearing cigar boxes for shoes. And with that, of course, he opened up the Enduro, which operated throughout the late 20s, 30s, 40s, and in 1950, he reopened as Juniors here on this very corner. Now, why did it become Juniors from Enduro? What happened that changed it all? The Enduro was more of a nightclub steakhouse uh, in the downtown area. During World War II, uh, a lot of shipbuilding was going on down at the Navy Yard, about a quarter of a mile from here, and they would get all of the workers and everybody coming in after work. It was a very busy time. World War II came to an end, and there was no more business to be had for that type of operation. My grandfather decided that all the soldiers were going to be coming back from overseas and uh, starting families, having families, that he was going to open a family restaurant called Junior's. Nino Pantano and Judy Pantano are a couple now, but when they started dating, Junior's was part of their, well, 
their get started together, I guess. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. You know, Hi all right, what you? happened here? What happened to juniors for the two of you, and when was it? This was in 1965. We were both teaching in Bedford-Stuyvesant, PS 129, which is now PS 308. And one afternoon, Nino came into my second grade teaching class, and he wanted to know about traveling to Europe, because he found out that I had lived and grown up in Europe, in Munich and Berlin, because my father worked for the government. So we were chatting for a while, and then every now and then we would meet in the hall, or he would send me little notes, and do you want to pick up the story? <laughs> Pick up the story from there. Well, I know many learned scientists are trying to capture the first 10 seconds of the Big Bang theory of the universe. So I would say the very first second of my universe, which is Judy, began when I walked into her classroom. Oh. <laughs> uh, we began taking the number 52 bus downtown to Brooklyn and we would stop off at Junior's. And downtown was Petula Clark's popular song at the time. So going downtown and coming to Junior's. But we began looking at each other's eyes, kind of starry-eyed in that beautiful, heady world of fatal attraction, so to speak. And? And, and that was the result. Well, Judy and Nino, thank you both very much. It's been a treat for us to talk with you. Thank you. Enjoy the enjoy the cheesecake. That's why I married her to enjoy my cheesecake. Do you have enough cheesecake? Well, now I can enjoy the performance at BAM. I'm well fed. Now, BAM. Uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Has been here a long time. Oh, th well, this building's been here since the early 1900s, but it originally began on Montague Street. Now, this is the original band in Brooklyn Heights, where their patrons lived. As a matter of fact, looking down Montague Street, that high-rise office building, that early skyscraper, is still there. This building burned in 1903, and when it did, they decided to move the new band to where their patrons now lived, Fourth Green, Clinton Hill. Like the rest of the institutions in downtown Brooklyn, they moved out as their patrons moved out. Hertz and Talent did this building. Uh, they, were, they were theater architects. Uh, and look, that cornice, by the way, which was taken off of, uh, in the 1950s, they're now planning to restore. Oh. Uh, the other moldings, beautiful, wonderful terracotta moldings, including cherubs and cupids and singing angels. This building had, in between the 1910s and 30s, the most amazing array of performers. They had Rachmaninoff, they had Toscanini, they even had edgier performers like the Denishon dancers, uh, the Ballet Russe, they had uh, Isadora Duncan, they had uh, Paul Robeson, um, Enrico Caruso, you know, sang here. He even collapsed on this stage. It was his penultimate performance. This is one of the institutions that came out of Victorian Brooklyn that put Brooklyn on the national map. Barry, take this. Let's measure this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that, David. They're right. They are 11 and a half feet wide. Now, what's 11 and a half feet? Well, these are known as the working men's cottages. They were built in 1879 by a Brooklyn philanthropist by the name of Alfred T. White, an amazing fellow. Years later, he was one of the movers behind the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. Yeah. Back in 1879, the slums of New York, the slums of Brooklyn, they were horrible. He suggested building houses like this for supervisory personnel. This is a plan of exactly where we are. We're in the garden right over here. Each house is only 11 and a half feet wide, but it was only for one family. So it was, God, that was huge. Luxurious, right, in those days. Mm -hmm. Now, the workers, they could live next door, and they, this is still here in its beautiful shape. This is the tower and home buildings. And there was a third project in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, these had floor-through apartments, cross ventilation, balconies, interior garden. You know, he said, build model tenements like that, and a, and a developer can make a good, honest 5%. His motto was philanthropy plus 5%. He knew the Americans and how they think. Well, the reason why he built these in those days, in the 1870s, this area had been built as a middle-class brownstone district in the 1840s. Mm. By the 1870s, the Irish were living here. It's working class. A big Irish district, South Brooklyn, the Irish loved it. By the 1920s, the Italians are beginning to move in. When I know this area in the 1950s, deep-dish Italian area. Right. Oh, yeah, lots of Italian stores over on Smith Street. 
Now, since the 1960s, new population has moved in. Young professionals who couldn't afford Brooklyn Heights, they moved across Atlantic Avenue here into Cobble Hill and also to the neighborhood to the south of us, Carroll Gardens. Take a ride on a bridge? Well, I never thought I'd be riding on a bridge. I figured in a car, maybe, on a bridge. Yeah, right. This is extraordinary. This is the Carroll Street Bridge. We're on the Gowanus Canal. Yeah. Now, I know when you look around, it doesn't look like much now. And, and, you know, for 35 years, the flushing system was broken, but they just repaired it. And there are great plans for the future of this place. Now, people could laugh. But this could be the Venice of New York one really? day. Well, the Upper West Side, remember, it was a dump 35, 40 years ago. Today, it's the most expensive neighborhood in New York City. Here's where we are, David. Here's the Gowanus Canal, where we are. It was at the southern end of this industrial district of Victorian Brooklyn, stretching from Greenpoint in Williamsburg right down to Red Hook and the Gowanus Canal. Uh, and remember, on either side of us, Park Slope to the east of us, Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens to the west of us. And, you know, a lot of the brownstone that covers these houses right. came into the Gowanus Canal. As a matter of fact, when it was working as a, as a, a real industrial canal, this is a picture of the bridge we're on. Yeah, There's we're, Carroll we're Street. Right here. Yeah, right. that's it. We're right there. Here's one of the tugs that used to ply the waters here. Uh, I like that. It's called the Bay Ridge. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Optimistic. And this, this is what I remember when it really was an industrial canal. By the way, that's further south from us, and that's the F train. A lot of people know that stop. Which is elevated here in Brooklyn, but it's a subway it's in a New subway. York when Absolutely. it goes into the city. Now, what about these neighborhoods around here now? Oh, what are they like? You wouldn't know st sitting here, but there are such beautiful neighborhoods. Just down the street is Carroll Gardens. Now, remember, north of that is Cobble Hill. Carroll Gardens and Cobble Hill, are one, they're, they're two of those brownstone neighbors like Fort Greene, mm -hmm. built in the 1850s and 60s, except Carroll Gardens is special. Wow. When Richard Butts, the developer, laid out Carroll Gardens in 1846, he put in extra wide, extra deep blocks, and that meant extra deep gardens. See, most brownstones have little tiny yeah, gardens right. in front, not in Carroll or Gardens. Or in the back, yeah. Well, if you go down President Street or Carroll Street yeah. here in this neighborhood, oh, the gardens, yep. deep and lush and beautiful, you would think you're in the Botanic Gardens. Now, just off, of, just in the middle of this neighborhood, Smith Street runs through it. Right. Well, it's become one of the new restaurant rows of New York City. People come from all over. This neighborhood, like Williamsburg and Fort Greene and Park Slope, this is one of those Brooklyn neighborhoods that's drawing people from all over. What an amazing view. And we're getting this view from the top of one of the great landmarks of Brooklyn, the Arch at Grand Army Plaza. We're standing on top of the Arch, right next to Frederick McMoney's famous Quadrica of 1892 that announces the glorious city of Brooklyn to the world. We started at Williamsburg Savings Bank, the old tower right there by downtown Brooklyn. Now we're here at the second yellow dot. We've seen how Brooklyn grew in circles. First in the mid 19th century, the Brownstone Belt, literally Fort Greene and Prospect Heights and Gorham Hill, Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens. Now it's the 1880s and 90s. The Brooklyn Bridge and the L train system is built and we have a new circle. I call it the Arts and Crafts Circle. Clinton Hill, Bedford Stuyvesant, oh, wasn't that, that a house gorgeous was house? Yeah. Uh, Crown Heights. Uh, Windsor Terrace, Park Slope, Prospect Lefferts Gardens, a whole new ring is built. What was so brilliant was they had the, the, the foresight, the vision to frame this new part of the city in a green belt, a frame of greenery. This was the work of James Stranahan, a great civic leader of Brooklyn. His statue is right down there. Now, had anybody tried to do that before? No, no. They Now, now he hired Olmsted and Vaux, who did Central Park, you know, only 10 yeah. years before, but they couldn't do that in New York. It was too expensive, the land in New York. They could do it here in Brooklyn. When they planned this new Greenbelt system, Look at this, the flatlands farms. south of here, they were all farmlands. And they created this park and parkway system. Uh, part of it was a parkway that ran through this flatland area to the beaches at Coney Island. It's called Ocean Parkway. And the other eastern parkway, we'll see in a moment, the, the juncture of the park and the parkways was Grand Army Plaza, where we are. Look but at this. But there was no arch. Well, this is from the 1860s, 70s, and you're right, there was no arch. And this was meant to be the green front door to this green belt system. You'd come from the busy city of Brooklyn, come through this green front door, and you would be in your country estate. So you're heading to the country. 
and, and now it's only a generation later that they decided to put in this, this arch we're on. In 1892, John Duncan, who did Grant's Tomb, was asked to create this arch. It made Flatbush Avenue the Champs-Élysées, gave Brooklyn its own Arc de Triomphe, and it gave Brooklyn its own very Parisian-style kamikaze traffic circle surrounding <laughs> oh, that's it. that's right. We know that. Now, which one is this? Well, we're looking at Eastern Parkway. Laid out in 1870, it runs eastward along the hills of the Terminal Moraine, already on their way out to eastern Long Island. It was meant as a linear park so that people living nearby could enjoy it. Who lived, who, who built Crown Heights in the 1880s and 90s? Did you see these people? The Nabobs of Brooklyn, money, money. Of the high Victorian era. And it was these people who created these great institutions that we see in front of us, as well as, by the way, in 1899, America's first and maybe the world's first children's museum on St. Mark's Avenue. Amazing Is that Brooklyn Museum? Well, we're looking down Eastern Parkway, actually just about from where we are, and this part, this triangle of land from Eastern Parkway South was supposed to be part of the park. But Olmsted and Vaux said, hey, hey, why are you dividing your park with a, a highway? Flatbush Avenue is like the New York State Thruway. Right. So they locked off this eastern part of the land and saved it for the cultural institution so they don't crowd the rural feeling of Prospect Park. And here we're seeing how this institute triangle was filled out. The Brooklyn Museum on the far eastern parcel. Oh, that is a great museum. You know, it's one of the greatest in the United States. Right. And that's not public relations, that is the really truth. Is right. A great Egyptian collection. And then the Botanic Gardens is squeezed in between Mount Prospect and the museum, the entrance, and then this great library that was finished in 1941. And this is where we are, right here on yes. top of the art. and there we are, right next to the Quadrica. Now, you notice Eastern Parkway, in the, after 1920, it all changed when the subway came. And the, the apartment houses were built on Eastern Parkway, the Jews came in, African Americans are in Bedford Stuyvesant, Irish in Park Slope, Italians in Cobble Hill. It's a new Brooklyn, mm -hmm. after 1920. Whoa, look, yeah. stairs. Oh, it looked a lot That looks better. great. They took those stairs off the Brooklyn Museum in the right, 1920s. Right. Well, they thought it would look more modern, it would look more open to the public, but it didn't work. I think they're going to put them back now, and it will once more relate the Brooklyn Museum to Eastern Parkway. That looks really great. And, and then next to it, of course, is the magnificent Botanic Gardens. It was, you know, the money that started that gardens was Alfred Treadway White the guy who did those three model tenements. Mm -hmm. 30 years later, he's using his money for the Botanic Gardens. Who designed it? Well, Olmsted Brothers, the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted. But frankly, it was Harold Capron, one of the earliest executives of the garden, really filled it out. He hired in 1915 Takeo Shiota, who created America's first Japanese garden. Now, was it exactly, did he duplicate gardens no. in Japan? See, that, that's what's wonderful about this Japanese garden. It, he, he 20th centuryized it. He adapted it to the modern world. That's why people come from all over to visit this botanic gardens. Then, on the other side of the Institute Triangle, Prospect Park, on the western side, Park Slope. One of the other big three neighborhoods of, right. of high Victorian Brooklyn, wealthy Brooklyn. Today, I think it's the Berkeley of New York City. You know, very, very politically correct. Right. And oh, gorgeous homes, just like in Crown Heights, just like in Hamilton Heights over in Harlem. Expensive. Beautiful homes. Mm. Today they are. They, they top a million dollars. Well, no wonder, right across the street from them, look at this wonderful landscape in Prospect Park they have. They're a few minutes walk from one of the great museums of the country. And imagine being able to go to the Botanic Gardens anytime you want and stroll those beautiful lanes. Barry, we've just barely come into the park, and already I feel like we've left the, the racket and the noise in New York City, Brooklyn, behind us. Well, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvin Vaux, who created Prospect Park, yeah. they'd love to hear you say that. That's exactly what they wanted you to feel. Now, Grand Army Plaza was the entrance to the great green belt of Brooklyn, but the Endale Arch we've just come through, that's the entrance to Prospect Park, think of ourselves as Alice. And we have fallen down the well from the busy, crazy city of Brooklyn and come through Endale Arch and we've come out into Wonderland. We are looking at the Long Meadow and we are standing here at the beginning of the Long Meadow. It's 90 acres, it's six times the size of the Sheep Meadow in Central Park. And by the way, this originally had sheep and a shepherd and that just reinforced the fantasy when you came through the Endale Arch. You know, Olmsted and Vaux, 
who created Central Park. They learned from their lessons in New York, mm -hmm. applied them here, and created this magnificent artificial landscape. You know, people think that they just built a wall around Mother Nature. No, 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 no. This is a three-dimensional landscape painting. Think of it as a Victorian version of an IMAX movie. Wow. And it, it, what I love about Prospect Park, they divided it up into three distinct landscapes, and you can feel that when you go through Prospect Park. The Long Meadow, we see that. The wooded area off to the east, which they're now restoring parts of that wooded area. Through the wooded area, you see the pools at mm -hmm. these yellow mm -hmm. dots here. The pools empty into the ravine brook, and that meanders its way through the woods, over waterfalls, through the nethermead and the lull water, and finally empties into the third great landscape, Prospect Lake. And that is at the southern end of the park, and when you're sitting around Prospect Lake, you think you, can, you are in the Adirondacks, huh. a thousand miles away. Over the years, they've added different buildings to the park. The beginning of the 20th century, Hellman Huberty did this boathouse. So that's not the same designers of the no, park? No, but it, they were wonderful architects, Hellman Huberty. And now this is being restored into a, a whole new use, public use. Oh, and this, I love this. Now, imagine all these people living around this park. You have Park Slope off to the west. You have Windsor Terrace and Flatbush to the south. You have Crown Heights off to the east. Think of them, each of them thinking of themselves the Duke of Devonshire, and they could take their trolley to their country estate in Derbyshire and enjoy the beauty of this landscape, a landscape that was created specifically for them. Rabbi Beryl Epstein, uh, we're here in Brooklyn. Tell us, Rabbi, where we are and why are we standing where we are? Okay, we're in the uh, Crown Heights section of Brooklyn on Eastern Parkway, uh, near 770 Eastern Parkway, which is the world headquarters of the Chabad Lubavitch movement. Now, describe how you're dressed and why. Um, this is a Jewish tradition, uh, customarily, biblically commanded. A Jewish man is not allowed to uh, cut his face at five places with a blade against the skin. One, two, three, four, five. Now, the side lock, the payas, is actually a very special uh, ceremony at the ch age of three for a child that we leave his side locks. And from that age, we begin education. And from then on, actually, a Jewish man is not allowed to put a blade against his face. Actually, a beard is considered holy. It brings blessings upon the family, upon the people. And the beard actually um, is the, the international sign language for a Jew is a beard. That is fascinating. I, never, I didn't know that. And also, the hat is actually uh, biblically uh, ordained. The yarmulke is biblically ordained, whereas the hat in each Hasidic group, many times you would be able to tell which Hasidic group by the hat that they wear. Rabbi, here in Brooklyn, I think there are three basic Hasidic neighborhoods. I think there's, I mean, there's Williamsburg, there's Crown Heights, and there's Borough Park. What are the differences between those three neighborhoods? I would say that the difference is that in Williamsburg, you have a predominantly a very introverted community, um, many times more business-oriented, uh, maybe diamond, diamond cutters, very talented people and very pious people. In Borough Park, you have, I think, a melting pot of many different Hasidic groups in terms of working with the outside world and, and studying all day. You may have many, uh, uh, a lot of variety. In Crown Heights, you have almost like a, I call it kind of the West Point of Hasidim, where it's not only our obligation to be a Hasidic Jew and raise a family and educate themselves, but also to reach out into the wild blue yonder all over the world to creating Jewish centers which cater to not only Jewish people, but also non-Jewish people. You know what fascinates me about the Hasidic communities? People come through them and they know that you physically inhabit these neighborhoods, but there's more than a physical inhabitation. Is, there's a spiritual inhabitation. I would say almost the definition of a Hasid is the fact that he not only is in touch with the physical, but he is in touch with the spiritual. We understand that the physical is only a reflection of the spiritual. 
gone on a marvelous way out. Been open in the river, we're gonna go to the marriage, my whole kill, get all the clothes, I'll go to the broken toilet, you know. From the Hasidic Jewish community to the biggest Caribbean parade in the world, all on Eastern Parkway. In Brooklyn, USA. Swami, how big is this? It's the largest parade in the world. The largest, the largest parade, parade in the world. How many yes. people show up in yeah, We Labor attract Day? Uh, three to four million people on the parkway. That's how much uh, people come to see the parade. Now, what's your part in all this? Well, I design costumes for the Labor Day Parade. We tried to make uh, pretty costumes for the parkway so that uh, everybody could enjoy themselves and bring a little culture to Brooklyn. This is, this is for what, what's called Carnival, but it actually started out as Mardi Gras, I believe, in Trinidad. Yes, uh, well, what happened is uh, the Carnival started in Trinidad. But uh, in, in as much as we have a large uh, population of Trinidadians here, they decided to start the parade, uh, have a parade here also. And it's been getting bigger and better every year. Planning start the day after the, 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 the following parade, where we, uh, we, we select a team and then we research that theme. For instance, if the theme is, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, Mother Nature, then we would go into Mother Nature and look for either birds, bees, or something, and then elaborate on that. How long is the parade from beginning to end? It's about three miles. Oh, but the wow. music is what drives the, the costume up the parkway. Without the music, it, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to lift this up, you know? It's the music, uh, the soca music, that uh, drives the, uh, the, 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 the revelers up the parkway. The, the beat of the music actually moves the costumes up the, up the parkway. We're at McKeever and Sullivan. We're near Prospect Park, Botanic Garden, and right behind me was the home of the great bums, the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was Ebbets Field, one of the great ballparks. We are standing at what used to be the main entrance to Charlie Ebbets Ebbets Field. I mean, Charlie Ebbets finally gave the Dodgers a permanent home in 1913. We're standing, We're standing right, right there. Uh, now, now there's uh, Sullivan, which is right down here. There's McKeever. As a matter of fact, in this aerial shot, you really have a better view of where we are. We're right down here at the corner of Sullivan, and those garage buildings are still here. And McKeever, in back of the stadium, is Bedford Avenue going up the hill towards the museum, the library, the Botanic Gardens. Isn't it appropriate? that this great American city had a baseball park as part of its cultural acropolis. Hey, it's America. And it was a neat ballpark to see a game. Little band box will place you right close to the field. And my father hated the Dodgers, so we always went to Yankee Stadium. We went to all three. And the Brooklyn fans had more fun, I think, than any baseball fans in the history of the game. And you can tell it by looking at photographs. They, they weren't a quiet bunch. They were not a quiet bunch. When you look at these photos, you realize the Dodgers fans reflected that the, the men that were on the baseball field ethnically, they were from all over Brooklyn and the Dodgers team itself. It had the Italians, the Irish, the Jews, the Poles, and finally in 1947, they broke the color barrier with Jackie Robinson, who, by the way, lived close by in Bedford-Stuyvesant. He was just one of many great players, including Gil Hodges. Little personal statement, let's get Gil Hodges in the Hall of Fame. Yes, it's about time, past due. Oh, now. This guy is not going into the <laughs> Hall of Fame. What are you doing in a Giants uniform? Don't, shh, don't tell. <laughs> Played a little baseball, but tried out here, actually, when I was 14 years old as a high school player. Wasn't too pumped up playing in Ebbets Field. <laughs> but do you realize this team, when Mr. O'Malley moved the team in, team in the late 50s to Los Angeles, the people of Brooklyn, of course, thought he was evil, the devil. He took the heart, the soul, the guts, the identity of Brooklyn to Los Angeles. You know, I hated O'Malley, too. But when you look back in retrospect, I think he really knew what he was doing. In those days, in 1957, L.A. looked like the future. Brooklyn was the past. Isn't it ironic that today, L.A. is more of a symbol of the past and Brooklyn is a symbol of the future? Do you know that when they tore down Ebbets Field in the early 60s, Greenwood Cemetery bought all of the topsoil, the infield, the outfield from Ebbets Field, trucked thousands of cubic yards of soil and used it as topsoil in <gasps> Greenwood Cemetery. Because Hello. who's buried there? Right. Charlie Ebbett. That means he's lying in Greenwood Cemetery, surrounded by the soil from his beloved Ebbets Field. We are standing here in Greenwood Cemetery. This was an amazingly progressive idea of the new city of Brooklyn back in the 1830s. It was designed as a 
romantic cemetery modeled after Mount Auburn in Boston, Mount Laurel in Philadelphia. Sounds like an oxymoron, romantic cemetery. Well, but the Victorians had this new modern idea of death. They wanted to get away from that grimness of the old medieval idea of death. And, you know, unlike today where we think, oh, nobody dies, it's so California, you know, nobody gets old, <laughs> nobody dies in, 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 in the United States. But we today, we don't live with death the way the Victorians did. And, and they felt in the 19th century that instead of death being this, this horrible termination of life, instead it was really a, a segue into another phase of existence. A little Eastern as well. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and this cemetery, I think, in its bucolic splendor, in, in this kind of heavenly feeling, it does transport you to a kind of heaven, which is exactly why this was so popular in the mid-19th century with New Yorkers and visitors. Now, would they the come city. out here? Oh, yeah, they started a ferry. From New York, you know this was the most popular sightseeing uh, venue in New York, except for Niagara Falls. So, so it, it attracted so many people, and it was so progressive, the idea. 30 years later, when Brooklyn created the Park and Parkway system, they continued that progressiveness in urban planning. Now, who are some of the other people buried here? Oh, so many. Uh, who, well, there was Henry Ward Beecher, who we've already spoken about, James Stranahan, who gave us the Park and Parkways and the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you have both Courier and Ives, uh -huh. both are buried here. Another great artist and craftsman, Louis Comfort Tiffany, uh -huh. is buried here. And I just went over and walked just a few feet from here, and Leonard Bernstein. And it's here. such a simple. Simple it really is. frame, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I love about Greenwood, the, the variety of the people, the variety of the funereal monuments. And as we stand here on the heights of the Terminal Marine, we can look out over the neighboring uh, community. Sunset Park was built in the 1880s. It has those distinctive bow front row houses marching down the slope of the moraine towards the harbor. And you don't think of New York having a hill like this. Oh, no. But looking out over the harbor, here is this, you know, fabulous monument, of course, uh, commemorating uh, the very first battle of the American Revolution, August 27, 1776, fought right here. Well, Minerva, you know, was paid for by Charles Higgins, who's buried right in back of her. He's the fellow who gave us India ink. Remember when it was smeared all over your hand? Well, Higgins is buried right behind her, but he was so proud of that battle that he paid for Minerva. And when people admire her here, they, they never realize she is saluting, in fact, and has a perfect view of her sister in the harbor, the Statue of Liberty. From peaceful, bucolic Greenwood Cemetery. David Flatbush is one of the original six towns of, of Old Kings County right. from the 17th century. And for the first 250 years of Flatbush's existence, it was bucolic. This gives you an idea of how bucolic Flatbush was when it was all Anglo-Dutch farms. In the first 250 years of its existence, it was the breadbasket for New York City across the river. Now, Flatbush Avenue, we forget, was the original New York State Thruway here in Brooklyn. It was actually a highway. You even had to pay tolls, which is an old idea. And the church in back of us became the symbol of Flatbush. This is the Dutch Reformed Church. The original church building went up in the middle of the 17th century. This church was built in 1798. Beautiful fieldstone construction on a brownstone base. And across the street, in 1786, Erasmus Hall was founded by some of the mentors of the young American Republic, including John Jay. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, which means they were they were talking back in 1786. They weren't shooting at each other. Uh, this was considered one of the finest academies of its day. Then, in the 1890s, it was turned into a public high school, and in 1903, they built the high school that we see. This building is still there, but in the court of the present high school. C.B.J. Snyder was the architect. He created public schools and high schools with functional planning, huge windows, high ceilings for plenty of light and air, because he felt that the students deserved the dignity of a, of a beautiful building. And a lot of graduates are well oh, known at this yeah. high school, yeah. Diva Barbara Streisand, right. uh, opera singer Beverly Sills, uh, chess king Bobby Fischer, they all came out of Erasmus High School. Right in back of us, only a few minutes in back of us, are the most exquisite Edwardian suburbs from the 1900s and 10s, beginning with Prospect Park South in 1898. All kinds of Beaux-Arts eclectic houses, Tudor Revival, uh, Anglo-Japanese, houses that looked like Tara. Then in 1920, the subway came through. This became the city, albeit with a slightly Jewish accent. By the 1930s, there were five movie palaces within a few blocks of where we're standing. What about now? Today, 
completely different world, but just as interesting. It's the heart of the Caribbean community here in Flatbush. It's, it's just part of, of the mosaic of Brooklyn. It shows you Brooklyn changes, but it's always an interesting place. We're getting closer and closer to the beach in Coney Island. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're in the neighborhood of Midwood. It's just south of where we've been in Flatbush. Midwood, you know, is part of the old town of Gravesend. Right. Now, when this was all farmland in 1900, Vinograph Studios, it was begun by a guy named Blackton Smith in 1897. This is one of our first Hollywood-type movie studios. And by the way, their first films, beginning in 1898, you know where they shot? Where? On, on the roof of a building on Nassau Street in downtown Manhattan. In Manhattan. Don't yeah. you love it? Okay, so, here we are. We're standing here. Now, when they built this, it's all farms around them. The Brighton Railroad line was right next to them. We're standing here. These are the original studios right over here where the parking lot is today. But otherwise, these three buildings are still here. Everything is still here. You know, today it's the Shalomit School for Girls. It's the oldest Orthodox Jewish school for girls. And I understand girls. the largest as well. Now, here we're looking up one of the neighboring streets. Obviously, it's the 1910s. There's the Brighton line, and there is the Vitagraph smokestack. Which is it's right, right over there. You know who worked here? I mean, you had, well, Mabel Norman. The first great funny girl on, on the screen. Uh, you had Norma Talmadge. When she lived, when she worked here, she lived over on Ocean Avenue in Flatbush. Um, oh, you had Oliver Hardy before there was before, Stan. Right. Yeah. Before. And Valentino was here, I think. Yeah, but you know what he was doing? Extra work when they needed a really? ferner. So what happened to the studio? Well, you know, this is business. It's capitalism. The big studios by the 1920s pushed out Vitagraph. In 1925, Warner Brothers took over this studio. When sound came in, they couldn't use the original studios along here. You can still see, by the way, the remains of those studios, but they were too close to the railroad. How can you burn Troy with a train going by? David. Oh, speaking of that, David, <laughs> you know where they used to shoot some of those scenes? Where? In the neighborhood, the neighbors' backyards. Troy was burned in the backyard of a hotel in Flatbush, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> the Brooklyn Tufts of the days, they were throwing stones at the Trojans, and they had to stop shooting. <laughs> and no wonder they moved to Hollywood. Yeah. You see that building over there? Now, that was turned in when talkies came in. They soundproofed that and turned it into their sound stages when Warner Brothers had this place. When you look around, you can still see the ghost of the original Hollywood. That is one huge bridge. I think it's one of the world's great beauties. It really is. Uh, that's the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. We're here in Fort Hamilton Bay Ridge, southwest corner of Brooklyn. And that bridge, when it went up in 1964, you know, Othman Amon did that bridge. He was a great engineer. He did the GW Bridge, the George Washington, and some of the other great bridges. That bridge, when it was built, was the longest suspension bridge in the world. When you started this tour on the Brooklyn Bridge, that was the longest in 1883 at 1,600 feet. This was the longest 80 years later at 4,200 feet. Whoa. This bridge is so long that when they, they designed it, the engineers had to take into account the curvature of the Earth's surface. And what I love about this bridge is the way that it symbolizes New York today. It's a beautiful portal entry into New York. And, and what it does for Bay Ridge, it rises over the rooftops of Bay Ridge, just like a medieval cathedral rises over a cathedral town. Well, you are so poetic. Oh, but Man, I, I love it. You can really spin words. I love words. this beautiful you know bridge. I love it. It's great. And, and now, Bay Ridge, where we are, this was built on the top of the terminal moraine. And where there's hills, there's wealth. That's why in the 1850s, well-to-do New Yorkers built their weekend homes, their summer homes, even their resorts. That's the Crescent Club. And this was lined with wonderful Victorian mansions. Uh, oh, it was, it, they used to come here by steamboat from New York. Oh, now, man, remember, Bay Ridge was not part of Brooklyn. It was suburban. It was a, a whole other town, New Utrecht, and it was very much like Brookline, Massachusetts is to the city of Boston, right over the city line. When the subway came through in the 1910s and 20s, the houses were ripped out for apartment houses, but I think Shore Road is the Riverside Drive of Brooklyn. Now, now we're right here. Yes, we're in Bay Ridge, and Bay Ridge kicks off this whole section of southwestern Brooklyn that's built around Gravesend Bay, the sweep of Gravesend Bay. Uh, you know, when the subway came, it brought the city. It brought the ethnic population with it. Bay Ridge, Scandinavian, Irish at first, then Italian and Greek. In the 1930s, 40s, 50s, this entire area, Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, 
Fort Hamilton, Bath Beach, Bensonhurst, Gravesend, this became the heart of Italian Brooklyn. I mean, Little Italy, Manhattan is the shadow of itself. If you want Italian New York, you either go to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx or you come here to Bensonhurst. What's it like at Christmas? Oh, the lights are fabulous. I mean, you know, aficionados of Christmas lights make a pilgrimage here, and each one has his or her favorite street, favorite house. Uh, to me, it's not Christmas unless I could come to Bensonhurst and Diker Heights and see those lights blazing. Barry, you got us here. Land's End. It's called Coney Island in Brooklynese. <laughs> On a hot summer Saturday, what could be better? You know, this really was an island at one time. Yeah, it, it was, was separated from Brooklyn by a little creek like when the Dutch found this place, absolutely. They named it Coney Island after the wild rabbits that they found here. Well, now New York's a little wild, but I don't know about the rabbits. And we started out up here at the old Williamsburg Savings Bank. We even went as far north as Williamsburg and Greenpoint. We're now 11 and a half miles south of Greenpoint in Coney Island. Mm. And a closer view of Coney Island, the, the island itself is amazing. The different communities here in Coney Island. At the far western end, Seagate, totally private community. Next to it, Coney Island, the hoi polloi of New York City. We can hear them. Brighton Beach is next to Coney Island, the little Odessa of New York, the heart of the Russian community here. Manhattan Beach, very quiet residential area. At the eastern end, Oriental Beach, now Kingsborough Community College. It's so diverse, Coney Island, and fascinating Look what it was years ago. In the mid-19th century, this was the Hamptons. Look at the New York, they used to come out by steamboat and railroad and come out here. Imagine getting dressed like that in August. Then, in, in the 1890s, when the L trains reached Coney Island, it opened it up to all of Brooklyn. On a good day in the 1900s, you could get 100,000 people coming to Coney Island. That was the period when they built the three great amusement parks. You had Dreamland was right over here where the New York Aquarium now is. Luna Park was across the street there. And of course, oh, the one that I remember, Steeplechase, Steeple yeah. where the parachute jump now stands. Did you do that? Uh, well, I was afraid of height. <laughs> I was, and I wish but I had. It would look so fun. I used to take the horses on, with my father. I was too young to take the horses in steeplechase on my own, yeah. so my father used to take me, and then we'd go into the amusement, the, the, the fun house at steeplechase. Was that the one where you sat down or something and shot out the... The oh, end of yeah, something. The, Do you know what after you went through the barrel, after you went through the moving sidewalk and the funny stairs, then, sure, you sat on a bench, the bench collapsed, the wall opened, and you went sliding out, and there was your parents waiting for you, you know? Now, in the 1920s, the subway came to Coney Island, and from then on, on a good day in the summer, you could get a million people on Coney Island. I could very well be one of those kids, because we used to come here when it looked like that. I never even knew there was sand. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, what, uh, this is now. What about the future? Well, you know, it's New York. You never know what the future is. I mean, hey, we, we were at the Gowanus Canal, and for all we know, one day that's going to be a wonderful sightseeing journey through old industrial New York. Coney Island, well, for one thing, it's still the magnificent South Shore Long Island Beach. It always was. It's the front door to the Atlantic Ocean for seven and a half million New Yorkers. I can almost picture uh, hydrofoil boats coming down from Manhattan around Gravesend Bay and landing people here on Coney Island in the future. You know, Elliot Walensky wrote a wonderful book, When Brooklyn Was the World, and, and he said, when land and water meet, wonderful things happen. And you know, it's still where land and water meet. Hey, Barry, good job. We've done Brooklyn. Isn't it a great city? Yeah. I mean, this is one of the great cities of the United States. It's had its trials, it's now coming back, and it's coming back into its own and in its own way, and that's what I love about Brooklyn. This city is a city of 50,000 acres. You know, in Texas, it would just be a mid-sized ranch. In Brooklyn, it's the world. Barry, thank you for showing me, teaching me about Brooklyn. And special thanks to all of you who have been so hospitable here in Brooklyn, uh, shown us your city, welcomed us here the way you did. It's been a wonderful walk around Brooklyn. And for all of us, Barry and me and all of us, make it a good evening. Discover Brooklyn online at 13.org.
Major funding for a walk around Brooklyn with David Hartman has been provided by Keyspan. It takes energy to breathe life back into our neighborhoods, to help a kid who's lost find a new direction, to fight breast cancer, 